Welcome everybody to this uh, latest installment of Contract Conversations. This is a series of bi-weekly webinars on contract disputes hosted by lawyers from across Mills and Reeve, which are aimed at people dealing with commercial contracts on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm Eric France, a commercial disputes partner uh, at Mills and Reeve based in our London office. And today I'm joined by a fellow facial hair enthusiast, uh, Ben Reeves. Hi, I'm Ben Reeves. I'm a senior associate in the commercial disputes team at Mills and Reeve. Okay, in this webinar, we're looking at the statutory duties that company directors are subject to when deciding whether or not to litigate a breach of contract claim. Um, as part of that, we're also going to take a look at some key action points for directors and those working with directors like in-house lawyers and contract managers in terms of the steps that they should take when a contract dispute arises. Uh, a company's articles of association will typically state that the directors are responsible for the management of the company and that the directors may exercise all the powers of the company for that purpose. Therefore, the power to commence defend and settle uh, court claims in the name of the company uh, lies with the directors. It follows that directors must exercise their powers in accordance with their statutory duties. Directors owe those duties to the company. The duties are not owed to the shareholders or, or creditors. Litigation uh, is of course an area of significant risk for companies. And that is particularly the case in the sphere of commercial contracts. If a company embarks on a misconceived breach of contract claim, the company could end up incurring significant legal costs and the dispute could also divert management's time away from the business, all without any realistic prospect of achieving the company's objectives. Conversely though, if a company acts too passively and doesn't bring a, 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 a court claim when it should, it will, unfail, it will fail to enforce its contractual rights, which could spell disaster for the company's future fortunes. The stakes are therefore extremely high. If a director makes a decision about the litigation in breach of his or her statutory duties, and this causes the company to suffer loss, the director could face a claim uh, by the company to pay compensation. The director would have to fund the defense of that claim and any monetary award made by the court uh, personally. So what are the key statutory duties that apply to directors when making decisions about litigation? In short, there are three key duties. First, the duty to promote the success of the company. Second, the duty to exercise independent judgment. And third, the duty to exercise reasonable care, skill and diligence. And these duties are all codified in the Companies Act 2006. So Section 172 of the Companies Act states that a director must act in the way that he considers in good faith would be most likely to promote the success of the company for the benefit of its members as a whole, and in doing so must have regard to, amongst other matters, the likely consequences of any decision in the long term, the interests of the company's employees, the need to foster the company's business relationships, the impact on the community and the environment, the desirability of the company maintaining a reputation for high standards of business conduct and the need to act fairly between members of the company. So while section 172 subsection 1 is subjective in nature, it does require the director to apply, to apply his or her mind to each of the statutory factors when deciding what he or she thinks is in the best interest of the company. The phrase amongst other matters is also important that phrase implies a requirement to consider any other factor that is relevant to the decision. It's also worth noting that section 172 subsection two makes clear that where the purposes of the company consist of purposes other than simply the benefit of the company, uh, benefit of the members, sorry. So I'm thinking of charitable companies and possibly companies established by statute. The question shifts slightly to what is the course of the action that would be most likely to achieve the company's purposes. Moving on to section 173, um, that section provides that a director must exercise independent judgment. So if you blindly follow what your lawyer says or just go along with the consensus of the other directors, that may well be a breach of duty. The individual director must apply his mind to the question at hand 
and must make his own decision. And section 174 codifies the duty of care that directors owe to their companies at common law. It states that a director must exercise reasonable care, skill and diligence. So what exactly did Parliament mean by the word reasonable in these circumstances? Subsection 2 gives more information on that and it essentially imposes two standards of reasonable care, skill and diligence. First, 2A imposes an objective standard that's appropriate to the company and the functions carried out by the director. So there would be a higher standard for a multinational PLC than there would be for a small family run business. 2B imposes a higher subjective standard in circumstances in which the individual director has more knowledge and experience than the objective standard. So I think the relevant duties can be explained quite succinctly. When making decisions about litigation, directors must consider and have regard to all of the factors expressly set out in section 172, consider and have regard to any other matter that is relevant to the decision. They must exercise reasonable care, skill and diligence at all times, and they must take the decision that the, the director considers would be most likely to promote the success of the company for the, uh, for the benefit of its members as a whole. Okay, so, so what are the key steps then that um, directors should take? Well, I think the first step in all but the, the simplest of cases is for directors to seek specialist legal advice, whether that's from a, a, an in-house uh, lawyer who's familiar with litigation or, or external litigation lawyers. And whilst, of course, this advice should address the pure legal merits of the claim, uh, advice should also be sought on a number of other things, including the value of the claim, uh, the future costs of bringing the litigation all the way through to a trial, uh, the risk of having to pay the other side's legal costs and what those costs might be, and also the risks concerning the enforcement of any uh, judgment that the court might make. And on the issue of costs, directors should also consider the different uh, financing options that might be available to the company, uh, particularly as it's now possible to obtain funding from uh, third party litigation funders in some cases. And we can help you identify whether a claim might be suitable for litigation funding and introduce you to specialist brokers. Okay, so points uh, two and three there, uh, privilege and the preservation of data. Directors should exercise reasonable care and skill in relation to issues of legal professional privilege and data retention. Directors and their advisors should consider how the company can best preserve legal professional privilege in respect of the documents that the company will create or receive in the future. Preserving privilege is crucial as it prevents documents that might be adverse to your case from being disclosed uh, to the other side. You should also take steps to preserve all documents and electronic data uh, that are potentially relevant to the dispute. You should ensure that policies that uh, call for the deletion of data automatically in your company are suspended. Um, if necessary, you should engage an expert to forensically uh, preserve the data. If the company fails to preserve relevant documents, the court may well draw an adverse inference from that failure um, at a later stage in the proceedings. And that, that, could be, that could be very costly in terms of the outcome of the case. So action point four, um, consider reputation. Litigation can of course have a massive impact on a company's reputation. Um, so if we take a recent notable example, Volkswagen's reputation was undoubtedly damaged by the so-called Dieselgate scandal. That scandal first emerged in 2015 but the subsequent litigation has prolonged that bad press. So for example, earlier this year, the Times reported that Mr. Justice Waxman described some of the arguments used by VW at a recent hearing as highly flawed, hopeless, and absurd. It's also notable that reputation features twice in the section 172 subsection one factors in that it, that section expressly states the need for directors to consider the need for the company, the need to foster the company's business re relationships and the desirability of the company maintaining a reputation for high standards of business conduct. Therefore, as part of their decision-making process, 
the directors should certainly consider how clients, suppliers and employees will react to the litigation. And if press interest is likely, they should consider a media and PR strategy. Step five, consider the options. So directors should discuss the different strategic options that are available with their lawyers. So is this a case where the company needs to seek urgent injunctive relief from the court? Or should the company carefully set out its case in pre-action correspondence? And whilst it might, might be tempting for a director to pick up the phone to his or her counterpart with a view to seeking a commercial solution, could this prejudice the company's position and show weakness? We find that often legal and commercial approaches work best in parallel. And then the final action point is obviously to take the decision itself. It's then up to the directors to weigh all of the information that they've gathered and to decide what course of action would be most likely to promote the success of the company for the benefit of its members as a whole. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the end of what we had prepared by way of uh, presentation. Um, so uh, just, does anybody have any, any questions for us um, about director's duties in the context of litigation? Okay, somebody um, anonymous has, has asked, um, to what extent will a court reviewing a decision uh, taken by a director in the context of section 172 defer to the director's business judgment? Then I can take that one, Eric. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I mean, courts definitely do, to a certain extent, defer to the business judgment of directors. You have the kind of business judgment rule, which, which essentially encapsulates that principle. However, it, it's worth noting that in the context of 172, the court is really looking to see whether the individual director has applied his mind to the right question and has gone about his decision-making process in the correct fashion, which essentially is in, uh, considering all the relevant factors, weighing that information up and then reaching his or her own decision. So the court definitely in relation to that specific section isn't looking to substitute its own decision for what the directors ultimately decided. It's just looking to essentially the legislation is supervising that decision-making process to make sure that companies are making the correct decisions. Okay, somebody else has asked, most decisions about litigation in my company are made below board level, uh, for example, by in-house counsel. How does that tie in with what, what uh, you say? Well, yeah, again, I can take that one. Um, I, I mean, boards definitely do delegate authority to commence litigation. Um, find that quite commonplace that decisions about litigation are really made by in-house in counsel a lot of the times. I think you just want to check in that situation. Has there actually been a proper decision taken by the board to commence that power and um, to uh, delegate that power down to in-house counsel or the relevant kind of body that's making that decision? Um, and you'd also want to check, is there anything contrary in the articles that suggests that you can't do that for any reason? But subject to that, it's absolutely fine. I mean, if something went wrong with that litigation, the original decision to delegate down to whoever is making the decision could itself be subject to a challenge and a review by the court. Um, so that's something to be wary about. But I mean, the reality is in, in the kind of smaller claims, I think it's absolutely fine. I think if it's a big ticket piece of litigation and certainly one that is going to affect the future fortunes of the company, I really think do think my, my view is that's a decision for the board and it's a decision where they need to scrutinize the process and make sure it's a decision that's made in the proper fashion. I think really it's the board's place to make that decision and that's the safest way to, uh, way to proceed in those circumstances. So for the big stuff, they shouldn't, they shouldn't uh, delegate, it, delegate their authority? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so somebody's, um, somebody else has asked, um, we're of course talking uh, of directors registered at Companies House, not nominal directors. I think that's right. We're, we're talking about um, um, directors with a capital D who um, who uh, uh, have been registered at Companies House, not um, 
not directors with a small d, the, the um, statutory duties that we've been describing apply to the, to the, to the directors with a capital D. Um, okay, does anybody else have any other, have any other questions? Okay, well, um, I think we'll leave it there then. Um, and we'll follow up. Um, well, if you have any further, if you have any further questions um, that, that occur to you um, afterwards, please do feel free to send us an email or connect with us on LinkedIn and send us a message that way. And we'll do our best to, um, to get back to you. Um, also, if there are any topics uh, that you'd like us to cover in a, in a future one, a future webinar in this series, then uh, please also do, do get in touch with us. Let us know, we'd be happy to, to try and cover anything you suggest. Um, and we'd also be grateful if you could um, just quickly fill in the two questions on, on this poll that my colleague is gonna put up on your screen. Here it is, right on time. Um, we'd really uh, appreciate any feedback you can give us, uh, helps us make these um, webinars better. Um, the next contract conversation uh, uh, in this series will be in two weeks time. And we'll be talking about how to terminate contracts uh, safely. And that's particularly in relation to supply contracts and the recent enactment of the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, which contains some controls on the ability to terminate certain kinds of supply contracts. So I, ho I hope you'll be able to join us uh, for that one in a fortnight's time. Um, Thanks very much. Thanks for joining us today and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon.